For anyone who's just joined this particular webinar, I'd like to welcome you to Gem A Live. I'm Julia Griffith from Jury Advisor. And today in this lesson, we're going to be talking about lead glass filling in ruby and sapphire. So ruby and sapphire are from the same mineral species, which is corundum, and lead glass filling is a treatment, which can be done in some other gemstones. Diamonds, for example, have lead glass filling. However, when it's a lead glass filled piece of corundum, it's quite unique. It's a treatment that stands out really uh, from all of the treatments, and we'll talk about why that is during this lecture. So it is quite a unique resulting product, uh, which is why I've chosen to do a whole lecture on it. So I do hope that you enjoy. So the learning outcomes for this session, the first part is that we're gonna go through what lead glass filled rubies and sapphires are. We're going to talk about their history and also about how they're made. So how we treat them and how we create these products. We are also going to talk about how this treatment affects the stone, because it's not just visual. We also have some physical properties that are altered by this treatment and also some durability issues as well. So we will look through all of those. And then lastly, we will look into how we can identify the stone. So we will be looking at observations as well as testing. So to start off, we're going to talk about what treatments are. So treatment it is the process of artificially altering a gemstone. Uh, and this can range from something really basic, such as a coating on the back of the stone or a foiling, all the way through to really advanced technical stuff where we treat things with high temperature, high pressure, and then throw a bunch of gamma rays at them as well to irradiate them. And we get a whole series of uh, results from these treatments and different treatments can be specified for different gem types. But ultimately, the aim of treatments is to make a gem look better or of higher quality and value than it would have done without the treatment. So, for example, these pictures here that you can see, the top picture we have non-treated sapphires, and you can see they're very pale, almost colorless in some of those crystals. But with simple heat treatment, we can actually convert these into those blue sapphires, bright blue sapphires that we all know and enjoy. When we treat gemstones, we do treat them not only for color, but we can also have a variety of color treat, um, clarity treatments, beg your pardon as well. So we can treat them for color and clarity. The treatment we're gonna talk about today actually covers both of these things. But just to have a look at a few more treatments, before and afters, these are all corundum treatments. Here is one for Mongsu Ruby, which Mongsu Ruby, the crystals typically have this blue sapphire core in them. And with some heat treatment, we can change and remove that blue coloration, leaving that nice bright, uh, bright red stone. Also, we have here another before and after. You have, again, sapphires, your bluish sapphires at the top before treatment. And then after treatment, you have these very uniform colors, very bright, vivid, yellowy orange colors. So this is your resulting sapphires from uh, a treatment known as beryllium diffusion. So you can actually see that we have a very large range of effect or degree of treatment as well, from something just being slightly altered to something being quite dramatically altered. So why do we treat gemstones? Well, the main reason is to make the gems more marketable so that we can sell them on the commercial market. Here in this picture, I'm actually holding a handful of rubies. But these uh, might not be recognized by a lot of people as rubies because they're not those bright red gemstones that we normally imagine when we think of a ruby. But these are rough rubies, but they are of very low quality. So they're industrial quality. You can see that they are opaque. Uh, that is due to the fact that they are riddled with fractures. And then you've also got uh, not a very desirable color. So rather than red, they're more of this purplish brownish colored corundum. But this is the starting material for the treatment that we'll be focusing on today. So with lead glass filling of Ruby, we can make a product that looks like this. So from before and after, you can see that this is quite a dramatic change. We have severely altered the gemstone and we have greatly improved the color, the clarity and the transparency of the stone. And this is now, not only has it been faceted, but that could be set in jewelry and worn. 
So what this has actually done is it offers a larger range of gem materials on the market because high quality commercial ruby is rare. So we also have a range of price points on the market. So from something that's untreated, if you had a natural, large, high quality red ruby from a desirable location, you could be hitting six figures a carat easily for that stone. Then we have some less uh, dramatic treatments such as heat treatments. Um, that will bring it down to maybe five figures a carat. So it's still very expensive. Diffusion, bring it down a little bit more. Flux healing, also um, around the same price. But then when you have a product like this, which is your lead glass filled ruby, we've really dropped the price. So originally when these came out, they would cost about a dollar or two per carat for traders. So that's your wholesale price. But now they seem to be more around 20 to $30 a carat, maybe a little bit more wholesale. And then retail, well, you know, you name your price, the retail markup might be, a few, you know, two to three times. But then if it's set in jewelry, you can actually end up with still a product that costs a few hundred dollars. There are examples of them costing a bit more than that as well. So that's why we treat is to actually add products to uh, the commercial gem industry. So let's talk a bit about glass filling and a bit of a history about glass filling. And this is going to be glass filling in general because there's more than one glass filling treatment. Uh, the first glass filling that we saw in Ruby actually came about in 1984. And this I'm going to refer to as glass infilling. This was done on, on high quality faceted rubies um, often that had a slightly larger size, maybe two to three carats, which is big for ruby. Uh, and they would actually have cavities at the back because what cutters would try and do would be to get the biggest size that they could. So if there happened to be a bit missing at the back of the stone, so be it, uh, just to get that face up size. Now, what they actually ended up doing in 1984 is a few products came onto the market, so rubies, that had a glass filling in those cavities. This was with normal silica glass, just filling in the cavities so that it looked like one complete stone rather than having these cavities at the back. These were quickly rejected by the trade, by consumers and by other traders and gemologists, basically saying you can't call this ruby, and they quickly disappeared from the market. And glass infilled stones, you don't see. It was just a almost trial and error that they did. But in 2004, a new glass filling came onto the market. And this wasn't normal silica glass. This was a lead glass. So it is still silica, but it has a high content of lead within it. And when you increase the lead content, what actually happens is some of the optical properties of that glass increases. So actually you get an increase in refractive indices and you get a well, refractive index, because there's only one, sorry. So you get an increase in refractive index and also an increase in dispersion. So they ended up using this lead glass, which more effectively fills the fractures in the stone. So this was brand new in 2004. But what was also different about this treatment is that they actually treated these rubies in their rough state. So you saw those that handful of rubies I was holding earlier, that is your starting material and they treat it in that state. Because if you were to facet those rough rubies, due to all their fractures, they would have crumbled apart into thousands of pieces. But what they are doing with this treatment is filling it with glass, which effectively sticks all the pieces together and fuses the pieces together so that they could then facet them. And once you have this material that's then facetable, you could then make these gems out of it and put them in the gem industry. And that's exactly what's happened. So let's talk about how they go about treating these stones with lead glass filling. So here is some more starting material. So this is from Mozambique. So typically very dark, opaque due to those fractures. And the first stage of treatment is they preform it which basically means to knock off any parts that they're not going to treat. In this case, it would be any areas that don't have any color and also maybe some matrix that's left on the stone. And then we're going to put it into an acid bath. And this acid bath basically clears out all of those fractures, getting them ready for being filled. So any mineral impurities or any uh, matrix that's left in there, it will actually strip all that away. And you're left with this here, which is just very low quality, 
we have um, very fragile now, now that we've bleached it, it's actually a very unstable, rough piece of material. And it looks very pale because what's actually happening is we're seeing all those fractures which are reflecting light. We then warm up this rough material. This warming process is at the modest temperatures of 900 to 1400 degrees Celsius. And this part of the treatment is to actually increase the redness of the rubies so that we're making them a better color. We then mix all of these pieces of rough with a lead oxide and silica powders. So this will then actually become our glassy flux, which is going to fill all of those fractures. Just to let you know, we can actually treat these rubies in bulk. So actually they can actually uh, mass produce them quite a lot, um, treating lots at once. Mm. And then also, uh, once they've done this, we can heat it to 900 degrees Celsius, and this will allow all that glass to melt and then to start flowing into all of these exposed fractures and cavities. After that, you end up with a product that looks a bit like this. And you can see that there is a dramatic increase in colour. There's also a dramatic increase in clarity. We can't see all of those white fractures that we saw before. You'll also notice that there's a big increase in luster. So now these stones are much shinier and that's because the glassy flux actually dissolves and then recrystallizes the ruby on the surfaces. And now this rough is ready for faceting. Now, when it comes to faceting this rough, we'll actually look into it a bit later, but the cutters don't know where the ruby ends and the glass begins. It's completely hidden all of those cracks which actually leads us onto um, some very interesting final products. And then after this stage, we can cut and polish them. If this has exposed any large cavities or fractures, it may then go back and get retreated again, just to make sure all of those cracks are filled. So let's have a look at some before and afters. Before, here is some really typical uh, starting material. This again is from Mozambique. We can see it's opaque. It's of a very undesirable, um, color, so this brownish color. And then during the treatment, we have this rough material here. So all of those fractures that were making it opaque before have now been filled with lead glass, which has similar optical properties to ruby, hiding all of those fractures and fusing all of the pieces of ruby together. And then once it's been faceted, it will look something like this. So a gem that's faceted and ready to be set in jewellery. So I think we can all agree that this is quite a dramatic before and after effect. Uh, it is arguable here that those gemstones at the end could be marketed as pink sapphires rather than rubies. But the reason that I chose this picture in this series is because all of these gems are actually from the same batch of gems. So these are the final products for that starting material. And you can see that it is quite a dramatic change. Now this treatment is really common in the industry. The reason for that is because the before material, this low grade industrial quality corundum is very common. It's probably the majority of corundum that we have. So therefore there's lots of material to treat in this fashion. And we're taking something that before was actually worthless. And even though it's not worth much now, it still equals a very, very large amount in a worthwhile business. So what does this treatment actually do to our gem? Well, first of all, and very importantly, it fuses the rough material together. Without the glass being there, this gem would never have existed because it wouldn't have been able to be faceted. And it does effectively camouflage all of those fractures. So if we should look at some pictures, here is a non-filled ruby not quite as bad quality as the starting material for our lead glass ruby, but this is just a low quality, low clarity ruby. And inside you can see that we actually have lots of fractures running along the surface of the gem and all inside. And what happens when there is a fracture in your gem is in a way there's a thin area of air in there and you have two surfaces, one at the top of the crack and one at the bottom of the crack. And when your light ray comes into your gem, when it hits the fracture, it will just reflect and scatter off of that fracture, meaning that the fracture will appear white and also it's not allowing light to easily travel in and out of the gem. So you don't have that transparency and you don't have that um, color either. 
But when it comes to lead glass filled rubies, what we've done is we've filled those fractures with a material that is optically similar to ruby. So inside our fracture, we have our glass filling. And when the light comes in and hits the fracture, it just continues its path as if the fracture wasn't even there. So increasing transparency, increasing our color, and also making those fractures look almost invisible. It's an extremely effective filling method. So how does this treatment affect the stone? So we can see that it affects its color because they're much brighter and redder than they were before. And that is due to the heat treatment part of this process. Also, the clarity is massively improved from something, you know, the way you could see all those fractures. And now, even though you see some inclusions, nowhere near as many. So its apparent clarity has certainly improved. And then we have the transparency. So the transparency of the gem has greatly improved due to the fact that those fractures are now almost invisible and the light's just traveling straight through them. Also, what is affected is the durability of the stone. And this is quite major. So we're gonna talk about this a lot more in just a moment's time. So durability, this is classed as an unstable treatment. Uh, basically, that means that this treatment is not permanent. And actually we can melt it and we can get rid of it if we want to. However, that does mean the destruction of the entire gem. So it is an unstable treatment. Most other treatments on the market for ruby and sapphire are permanent. So that means that you know you can wear them in the light, you can put them under a jeweler's torch and they remain as they were before. Uh, the reason that this particular product is unstable is mainly because of the difference between the two materials that actually make up this product, which is your corundum, your ruby, and also this lead glass. So we do have a difference in the properties of the material. We have a difference in hardness, and that's because our ruby is nine and our lead glass is four to five, uh, which is lower than typical glass with the lead that lowers the hardness. Also, there's a difference in toughness. So uh, the glass is much more easily broken than our ruby. And lastly, there is a big difference in the chemical stability of both of these materials. Sapphire and ruby are generally very stable, whereas your lead glass can be affected by a number of things. So let's look into a bit more of that now. So first off, we have the jeweler's torch. Now with a, a jeweler's torch, the lead glass itself is quite a low melting point, definitely compared to sapphire. Um, sapphires have, you know, a few, I think a couple of thousand degrees, 2,100 degrees is their melting point. But our lead glass is actually six to 700 degrees centigrade, which a jeweler's torch exceeds by far. So in these pictures, your top picture, you can see the facet of a lead glass filled sapphire here. You can just see some surface reaching fractures there as well. And that's before it's been under the jeweler's torch. And then the picture below is after it's been in contact with the jeweler's torch. And what's happened is the lead glass filling has started to melt and some has seeped out of those fractures. I've spoken to a number of jewelers who actually have had a really much worse experience with uh, lead glass filled corundum and jewelers torches, where literally they say that the gems fall apart completely. So uh, that is very possible as well. It does depend on the exact mixture of the glass filling because that can vary from treater to treater. Uh, but sometimes a jewelers torch can absolutely destroy these things and just leaving a few fragments of ruby or sapphire afterwards. So do be very careful with a jeweler's torch and this product. Another thing that will negatively affect these gems is a jeweler's pickle. So something again, that's very commonly used in a workshop. So this is hydrochloric acid. And here are some pictures again, before and after. So before we can't see any of those surface reaching fractures, but afterwards we can, they actually are appearing white. So we see this network of fractures now on the surface. And the reason for that is that the acid has actually attacked all of those surfaces of the glass areas. So we end up having the, those glassy areas eroded and they then look and appear white to us. There are also some other things that um, you use commonly on jewelry, for example, cleaners, ultrasonic steam cleaners, um, caustic soda, ammonia. Uh, all of these things will also damage 
the glass portion of this product. And then also we have some more household uh, everyday items such as lemon juice and vinegar. Uh, now I've actually heard from a number of people that these can completely dissolve away the glass, just leaving fragments of ruby left at the end. I've tried it myself and unfortunately mine uh, didn't dissolve the glass, which was very disappointing. But I did have some more success at destroying my rubies with bleach and cleaners. So uh, let's talk about that. I actually tried Silic, uh, Silic Bang. So you know this one, bang and the dirt is gone. So here's our before. You can see that uh, this is my lead glass filled ruby. It looks okay at the moment. But then after one minute in Silic Bang, that completely started to erode away at all those surface reaching fractures and the glass inside. I also did it after 10 minutes. So it got a little bit worse. Uh, really, I should carry on this trial and do it for a day or two and see if I can completely destroy my ruby. So in this instance, bang, and the gem is gone. So yes, stay away or do not clean if you're wearing this product. Uh, so this actually brings us on to a very big question, is whether lead glass filling is just a treatment. Because if we think about what we have created with this treatment, uh, we've created stones that would not have existed if it wasn't for this treatment. As I said earlier, with the rough material being so fractured, it would not have been facetable. It would have just fallen apart into a lot of pieces. So we've actually created something that wouldn't have existed and that's because we've fused it together with glass. We don't actually know how much of the stone is, is glass, and this can actually really vary. I know that some only have a little bit of glass in the fractures. However, a large majority will actually be very heavily filled with glass. Sometimes half of it can be glass. I've heard uh, reports of it 90% of the ruby being glass. So, you know, is it a ruby still if it's mainly glass? This is the question. Is it just a treatment? And very importantly, the properties of this resulting product, so of these lead glass filled rubies, they are not the same for their properties, for their durability, and they're not the same as any other ruby product on the market. Okay, so anything else that's been treated, so any of our heat treatment, diffusion treatment, natural, even our synthetics, all of these have that hardness of nine on the most scale of hardness. They are all tough gems, they all, react, they all react the same to different chemicals and different heat. But when it comes to these lead glass filled rubies, they have a completely different reaction. The properties are completely different. So can you just call it a ruby treatment? The general consensus and more and more laboratories are agreeing, um, so gemolog gemological laboratories are agreeing that this isn't just a treatment. So the gem labs are saying that really this is a composite stone and should be named as so. So a composite stone is a gemstone that's made up of two parts, so two materials or more, uh, and that is exactly what we've got because we've got a ruby and lead glass. It's those two things. So really this is a composite gem. And therefore disclosure of this true identity, saying that it's a composite gem or a ruby that is filled with glass is of utmost importance. Because if we do not disclose this information, considering that it should be treated differently to other rubies that you might have, uh, you can actually get yourself into a bit of a sticky situation. If someone takes a ruby home thinking it's just a ruby that's been treated and they actually find out it's glass and then they do some cleaning and their gem falls apart. So this is a composite gemstone. Other names that we have commonly in the trade for this gem, we have a glass ruby composites. That's actually a very good term to use because it actually says exactly what this stone is made out of. And we also have composite ruby, assembled ruby and manufactured products. These are fine, however, they are a bit vague because we do have other composite rubies such as our corundum doublets. Uh, so a little bit vague, but you also might hear these rubies being called that. Uh, you also get terms such as filled ruby, glass filled ruby and fissure filled ruby. Uh, these again are okay, however, uh, you always need to look further into what that actually means. Because as I mentioned earlier, we do have lead 
um, beg your pardon, we do have glass infilling of rubies, that treatment that didn't last long, but back in the 1980s. So therefore, uh, I have actually had conversations with people where we're talking about different treatments and we had no idea because we're just saying glass filling and we think we're talking about the same thing, but actually we're not because there's that crossover in terminology. So be careful with saying those. Um, I always try and say lead glass filled ruby. And then we have these other terms as well. These are actually all trade names or brand names that other companies might have. And this is actually their way of trying to disclose the treatment to you. And on the website, if you looked up what these phrases mean, they'll explain that it's lead glass filled. Uh, but here we've got Palmai Ruby. So that's actually Thai for new treatment. But be warned because that Palmai is actually used for um, every, almost every new Ruby treatment that comes onto the market. So it might not always mean the same thing. So watch out for that. Uh, we also have hybrid rubies. So that's a brand name that they use. Uh, Mahaleo is another one, which means equal match. And then also we have organic ruby, which I think is actually quite misleading in a number of ways. But here we go. Uh, so let's uh, just pause here to have a bit of a summary on what we've learned so far. So this lead glass filling of rubies has been on the market since 2004. And it is made from industrial, uh, industrial quality corundum that's been treated in the rough and had its fractures filled with a high lead content glass. The resulting stones are of commercial quality. However, they do differ greatly in regards to their properties. And then the resulting product, it is a composite. It's not the same as any other ruby product, product on the market because the ruby and the glass make up this one gem. And therefore this treatment must be disclosed. So verbally, uh, when someone's buying the product or through written. So often what you might see, particularly online, a lot of these rubies are described just with a simple F at the end of their description. This stands for filling and then elsewhere on the website they will. Uh, explain what this means a bit more. But this is extremely important, this disclosure, because actually there was um, a very big superstore in America that got in a lot of trouble back in 2014 for not correctly disclosing this treatment or this product in you know, the correct way. And what happened is they ended up getting publicly slammed for doing so, publicly shamed. Uh, it was in all the magazines and all over online, basically saying that these products were sold as genuine natural rubies when actually a majority of them were made up of glass. So do be careful. And also that's uh, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to use terms such as genuine and real. Because, you know, when students used to say to me, like, is this real? I'd say, oh, well, you know, you're not imagining it because... Yeah, I'm a very cheeky tutor. And then um, the other problem like with the word natural, is this stone natural? Well, that completely depends on what you're actually referring to. Because if you're referring to the origins, is this stone of natural origin? Well, the answer is yes, because the rough material was natural. But then if you ask, is this product a natural product? The answer is no, because it's been so heavily treated, it's been mixed together with glass, the resulting product is heavily treated and a composite stone. So no, you cannot say that it's natural. So do be careful with those terms, especially when there's a crossover. But the correct disclosure for this stone would be a ruby glass composite or lead glass filled ruby. Now let's move on to the second section, so the middle section of this presentation, which is, oh, which is identification. So uh, with testing, when we have a look at gemological testing, uh, we can test these gems. However, often it doesn't actually indicate this treatment or because we're dealing with a product that is made up of two different materials, we may actually have some confusing mixed results. So although testing may provide some clues, it can be confusing. But it can very easily be identified by eye, thank God. So what we can do is uh, have a look through our observations. I've got some great pictures lined up for you so that we can really get some experience and learn what is in these stones visually so that we can identify them. And we're gonna start off with surface reaching fractures. There must be surface reaching fractures within our lead glass filled stones because otherwise they couldn't have been filled in the first place. But with surface reaching fractures, this is not a diagnostic feature. This is an indicative feature. And it's actually the first feature that I normally spot if I'm out and about in a trade show. And I might see a bucket of rubies being advertised because they are often sold um, en masse. 
and I'll pick one up and actually I will just with my unaided eye rock the stone under the light and just have a look at that surface have a look at the light bouncing off that surface and if it's covered in fractures or if it shows some surface reaching fractures that is my first indication that it might be glass filled and then I will look for further confirmation. So with the surface reaching fractures in this picture you can see that uh, this stone is riddled with fractures absolutely covered in them. So uh, these are all of the fractures just on the surface They've been filled with glass and actually you can see that the glass areas is of a slight lower luster than the ruby areas and that's because that's probably damaged. So we have our fractures all over this stone and that's actually indicating in a way that this stone has quite a lot of filling within it. Here is another table facet of a fracture filled stone, but if you have a look um, in comparison, this is a lot more subtle than the one before. But you can see just running along here, we do have that surface reaching fracture and that is not diagnostic of anything. However, it suggests that we should certainly spend some time and just check that it hasn't got any fillings. So this is a lead glass filled stone. Uh, you might suggest from what you see that this is slightly less glass than this one, but we don't know because there could be some massive fractures and cavities on the back. Other things that we might see, so we, um, we have a luster difference. Uh, so not only will you see it in fractures if the fractures are wide, like in the previous picture, or a couple of pictures ago, uh, but also you might have cavities on the surface of a stone that has been filled with glass. And in these areas, so you can see that you've got this boundary where you then have a contrast and luster between this area here in the center, which is our glassy area, and then this here. So this is our ruby here, which has our higher luster. Now, the reason for this luster difference it is to do with hardness. Because of the lead glass being such of, of such low hardness, it actually takes uh, worse polish and also can be damaged more easily. So therefore, uh, luster is reduced. Um, some people will think it's just because it's glass that it has a lower luster because glass normally has vitreous luster and our ruby has bright vitreous luster. But due to that very high lead content in this glass, actually, you end up really increasing the luster because the RI has been increased. So therefore, actually, this difference in luster you're seeing is all to do with hardness. So uh, you do often get cavities within our lead glass filled stones. So here's a filled cavity here. Um, the reason is, is when the cutter is cutting the stone, they don't know which part of the stone is ruby and which part of the stone is glass. So therefore cavities like this are actually quite common. And you can imagine then that this is very vulnerable to getting damaged. Here's another uh, picture showing the luster difference. And I love this picture because actually you can see for this stone, pretty much half of it is glass. So that whole pavilion, you can see the boundary running around here You've got a gas bubble there, so that's still glass. And it's just absolutely amazing that this is pretty much half glass. And you can see this very low luster in the center area here, which is the glass area. And also it's heavily abraded as well due to that softness of the glass. Another feature that you see, and now this is diagnostic of lead glass filling in a, in a fracture filled ruby. Uh, so you do get color flashes. Uh, color flashes, they're also known as the flash effect. And in ruby, in lead glass filled ruby, these will appear blue. So blue to orange mainly, but you may also get some yellow and green as well. So you can actually see it running through the fracture here. Color flashes are best seen edge on to the fracture. So face onto the fracture, you won't see them as easily. But if you have a look at the side of the fracture, they do then become very apparent and you get these color flashes from the glass. Uh, absolutely diagnostic, telling you that there's glass in that area. And it's actually quite wonderful because you can see when you're looking at the color flashes, you can see exactly where that fracture was. So you can see exactly where it's been filled when you're looking at these color flashes. I actually think they're quite beautiful. They look or what I, what I imagine to be uh, electricity, what electricity looks like, I believe. Here, um, here is another color flash effect in a ruby. So here, following along, we're looking at the edge of the fracture again, we're seeing that blue color flash really clearly, absolutely diagnostic that this stone is a lead glass filled ruby. 
Another feature which you might see are gas bubbles. So, excuse me. So, gas bubbles. You will never see gas bubbles in a natural ruby or even a, well, yes, you'll never see one in any other treated ruby. Uh, to see a gas bubble, it is telling you that that part of the material or that material on the whole is actually an artificial material. Uh, so gas bubbles will occur just in those glassy areas. And actually it can indicate how big that area of glass is in the stone. Because if you have a very big round bubble, then you know that that bubble is in a big area of glass. So in this picture, you can actually see these smaller round bubbles. So that's indicating that they're in nice little fractures with some width. And then we've got some larger bubbles here, which are actually quite flattened. So they might be in a narrower fracture. But we know that there must be some artificial material in this ruby. Otherwise, those gas bubbles would not be there because they cannot occur in crystalline materials without being in a filling. Here is another picture of gas bubbles within a fracture. In this case, they've been extremely squashed. You can actually see that here, this line running along diagonally just here, that is the very surface of the fracture, so right at the top of the facet there. And then running away from us is that glass filled fracture. You can't actually see the fracture itself, it's invisible due to that filling. But then we have all these very, very flat trapped gas bubbles within them that were probably trying to escape during that process of getting treated, but then solidified, they're now stuck there forever, or at least until they're melted out. Another thing that you will see very common within our glass filled rubies are cavities. And normally these cavities are actually half gas bubbles because it's where a gas bubble had uh, occurred within the glassy area that then it was faceted and leaving this half gas bubble on the surface. So you can see that it's actually got a wonderful luster inside the gas bubble or the half bubble here. Uh, and then on the surface, you can see that boundary where it runs between the glass and the ruby. And you have the lower luster of the glass compared to the higher luster of the ruby. Here's another cavity. So again, down here, this line here is almost our boundary in this instance between our ruby and our glass. So this is a very large glass area. And then you've also got that half bubble cavity there. Another um, identifying feature, so this is again is indicative, not necessarily diagnostic, uh, but you have flow structures. And flow structures basically occur within the glassy areas. And the reason that um, this happens, if you, uh, if you know a bit about the observations of normal paste, the man-made glass, we often get swells within them where it solidifies. Uh, the same thing is going on here. So the glass has flowed into the fractures and then it's solidified. It hasn't crystallized, it's crystallized. It's just solidified as it is. And you often kind of get these swells within those glassy areas still, but within the fractures. And these are known as flow structures. So flow structures, they are, um, well, to me, they look anything like water can look. And they are also indicating to you where those areas of glass are. Here's another up close look at these flow structures. You can see here this kind of um, mottled appearance looks to me a bit like a bit like the sea. So anything that looks a bit like water, that's your flow structure. And it's where the glass is what swells within it within that fracture. And the last feature, which I'm going to talk about for lead glass fillings, is these yellow patches. So in the center just here, we can actually see there is a very large yellow patch. That is actually due to a very large area of glass. The glass that is used to fill these rubies are colorless to near colorless or have this yellow tint. So if you do see this yellow tint to them, then actually that indicates a very large area of glass. Uh, the reason that it's yellow, there, there is no reason that it's yellow. It's actually just due to the fluxing mixture that they've created. So um, it doesn't affect the overall color of the ruby, though, unless it's in these very big patches. I've got another picture here. So this is a ruby, lead glass filled ruby that's on top of uh, transmitted light, so on top of a flat light. This is when you'll really easily see any patches of color that might be there. So we actually have a yellow patch just here at the corner, at the corner, at the edge, and then another one on this edge here too. So indicating that you've got larger areas of glass in these areas. These lead glass filled rubies can also contain natural inclusions. 
So in lead glass filled rubies, I have seen zircon halos, I've seen crystals, I've seen expanded crystals. Uh, this is a picture of silk, which is your rutile needles here, intersecting rutile needles. Uh, all of these are still present. So just uh, by the fact that you have natural inclusions in your stone does not mean that you don't need to look for treated um, treatments because these inclusions do survive the heating process. Where the heating process is quite low, it doesn't destroy any of these inclusions. We also have uh, another feature for our ruby. Uh, so this occurs in rubies and sapphires, which is lamellar twin planes. So lamellar twin planes, just a growth defect of our corundum. And you can see it in these parallel lines running along the stone here. So again, just because you have this natural feature in the stone, uh, it still means you need to go ahead and do your checks for different treatments. They can also show asterism. So you can get star rubies that have been lead glass filled. Now these uh, came onto the market in 2010, so they are a more recent product. They've been around for about a decade. Uh, I couldn't quite believe this when I saw it because from first looks, you'd never guess that this has gone through a treatment as extreme as lead glass filling, because you might think it would affect the asterism. But no, it looks great. So you still have this wonderful bright star. There is a little clue in this picture, which says that we should look for treatments. And that is that surface reaching fracture there. So not a diagnostic feature, but certainly something we need to explore a bit further. And lo and behold, when I turned around this stone, I saw these gas bubbles inside of it. So proving that this area of the ruby is not ruby, it must be an artificial material, and it's because it's been lead glass filled. So that's my proof. So let's go through a summary of observational features for lead glass filled ruby. Uh, so we've got our surface reaching fractures, which is indicative. Our luster differences on the surface, which says that something's definitely going on. There's a mixture of materials in this stone. We also have our blue color flashes, which are absolutely diagnostic of this treatment in ruby. So if you have your red stone, blue color flashes, it's been lead glass filled. We also have our cavities, so our half gas bubbles, uh, full gas bubbles trapped inside the glass inside, and flow structures and yellow patches of glass. So all together, this is actually quite a unique set of features. This doesn't occur in any other gemstone. So if we have uh, certainly some of the characteristic um, observations paired with diagnostic observations, then you can positively identify this stone. So if you have a red stone, blue color flashes, that's actually all you need right there. <laughs> You've got yourself an identity. You can then look for surface reaching fractures because they will be there um, for those stones. Have a look for these other things to see if you can see them as well, which just backs up your evidence for identification. We're now going to move on to cobalt lead glass filled sapphires. And the reason that we're going to talk about this separately is because even though it's a very similar product to the lead glass filled rubies, uh, there are some major differences. And the reason for those differences is because of this here, and it's your cobalt. So this is a coloring element which is added to these stones. And this is actually what causes them to appear blue. So cobalt lead glass filled sapphires, we're actually using a cobalt blue glass to fill the sapphires. And with that, we actually get a different set or additional observation features which are unique to these stones. So cobalt lead glass filled sapphires, they appeared on the market in 2007, so a bit after rubies. And the starting material, rather than being blue sapphire, are actually a colorless or near colorless corundum. So the sapphire itself actually doesn't have color. So here's an example of the starting material. This is Gouda Sapphire, uh, and this is very, very low quality again. So it's industrial quality, it lacks color, and it's opaque because it's full of fractures. So um, this is our starting material. If it's not fractured, actually, it might be treated in another way. So it's the very, very low industrial quality fractured starting material that is in this treatment. During the treatment, we actually are filling it full of this cobalt lead blue glass, filling the sapphires, and here is our material in the center. Um, so basically a mixture now of glass and sapphire. And then after 
we have, again, a very dramatic uh, degree of treatment for this stone, and we actually have something which is fashionable and able to be set in jewelry and put onto the commercial market. So again, another very extreme before and after treatment, and the result is a composite gemstone, so a mixture of corundum and glass. Identification for these gemstones. So it does share a number of observations with the lead glass filled ruby. So surface reaching fractures, which I've shown here, uh, and also that luster difference. If the fracture is a bit wide, you might be able to see that luster difference where you've got the glass area versus the sapphire area. We may also have cavities. So we've actually got a little one just up there and gas bubbles on the inside and also flow structures. So they are all the same things as our lead glass filled rubies. But we also have some additional features which will positively identify this gem as well. So let's have a look at some of those. So first of all, one of the unique features that are in these cobalt lead glass filled sapphires is the concentration of color within those fractures. And the reason for this is that it's the glass filling that's causing the blue color rather than the sapphire. So you end up with this network of concentration of colors, which is actually telling you exactly or showing you exactly where all those filled fractures are. Because everywhere you see blue, that's actually your glass area. You will also see that the rest of the host material lacks color. So for example, here in this picture, you can see that the body material actually is colorless. It's also transparent. So if you've got those two things together, a colorless transparent host with this network of concentration of color within fractures, you've got an identity for a cobalt lead glass filled sapphire. The reason that I stress colorless and transparent is because you can get gemstones that are extremely low quality again, so full of fractures, colorless. Uh, however, they don't actually fill it with glass, they just fill it with dye. And in that case, you'll get the concentration of color in the fractures, but in a white, opaque material. So it's different for when it's faceted and clear, um, transparent like this, you know that it's the cobalt lead glass filled. And another absolutely positive identification observation, so absolutely diagnostic, are colour flashes. And when it comes to a cobalt lead glass filled sapphire, they appear pink. So here at the bottom, we actually have these pink colour flashes for us. And these are again edge on to the fracture, it's where we see them the best. Um, and that is telling us that this is a filled stone, so a lead glass filled sapphire. So the fact that we see these best edge on view, um, I should stress that it's very important always to look at every direction through the stone to make sure you can see these features. because It's a very directional feature. So the summary of observational features for our cobalt lead glass filled sapphires. So the same as Ruby for surface reaching fractures, luster differences, cavities, gas bubbles, flow structures, but then uniquely has this concentration of color within those fractures. Uh, the rest of the material is colorless and transparent. And then you'll also see these pink color flashes. So again, we've got a very unique set of features which can help us to absolutely identify the stone. There are also other colors of lead glass filled corundum. So here we have just these whitish ones, which means that just normal dye has been put into those white starting materials. And then we have some other colors as well. So you can actually see some of the areas have concentration of color, but for in this case, it's green in this green lead glass filled sapphire. And then also you've got yellow down here. So a slight concentration of color there. Otherwise, all the other features should be the same. So again, color flashes, but they might be a different color because the glass is a different color. But color flashes, you should still see luster differences, gas bubbles should still all be in there. So let's talk about the final part of this lecture. So on to testing. So how can we actually use our gemological tests to identify this stone? Uh, now, Really, we have to consider what material we're using before even thinking about testing it, because the material, the product that we're using is a mixture of two different materials. So our lead glass filled ruby and sapphire, it's a composite of corundum and glass. 
And for that reason, we can expect to have some mixed results from these tests. Also, we have to remember that these two materials, even though they're similar, we actually have different things causing the color because in our ruby, it is the ruby itself that has the color. So therefore we can expect results for ruby, especially for those color tests that we have. And then for our sapphire, the sapphire itself is colorless and it's the glass that's giving it color. So therefore this will affect our results as well. So we have to bear this in mind, especially when we're doing those tests that are based on color, um, because it depends on actually what's causing the color, depends on um, then what result we will then get. Now, uh, we're going to talk through these test results uh, that we can expect for these products. If you're uh, not a gemologist, don't worry, I'll give a brief introduction to uh, the instrument so that you can follow along. So we're going to start off with the polariscope. The polariscope is a really simple tool that basically tells us whether our gem is singly refractive, doubly refractive or polycrystalline. So all we have to do is put it onto the piece of equipment, we give it a turn and it will give us a pattern of light which we can then conclude its optical nature. When it comes to corundum, corundum is doubly refractive and lead glass is singly refractive. So we actually have a very large difference in optical nature between these two materials. So what happens when we have a mixture of the two? So when we have these lead glass filled corundums? Well, from experience, what I normally see is that actually the lead glass filled corundum gives the same result as it would as normal corundum. So it typically gives a doubly refractive result. The reason for this is, is often where it's a network of fractures, uh, the body of the material reacts as it would and the fractures are actually normally quite fine so that you don't actually, it doesn't interfere so much with this test. However, the more glass that's in the material, this can change and actually you might get a mixed result where it goes maybe a patchy light and dark as you turn the stone, which would indicate a singly refractive material. Therefore, it just goes to show that this is not a reliable test uh, to identify the stone. It might not indicate the treatment at all. So just stressing the importance of observation. Uh, for the refractometer, this again, um, not so simple piece of equipment, but uh, it will tell us basically the refractive index of the material. So basically how much a material bends light. And we have very different uh, amounts of, uh, of different degrees of refraction in different gemstones. So this is how we can use it to identify different materials. So our corundum normally, uh, so it's doubly refractive, it has an RI of 1.76 to 1.78 and a biofringence of 0.008 to 0.009. Our lead glass is a singly refractive material, as we've already said, and this has an RI of 1.75 to 1.76. So this is often nearly overlapping with corundum. Uh, the more lead content that it has, the RI can go even higher because as we increase that lead content, you can get RIs that are even beyond that. And it's this crossover in RIs between corundum and lead glass that makes this filling so effective. But it's singly refractive, it does not have biofringence because of that. So on the refractometer, what's going to happen? Well, normally the lead glass filled corundum typically gives a corundum result. Again, mainly because the facet that we often test, it might have a few surface reaching fractures on it, but otherwise the majority is often ruby. So therefore this test might not indicate that actually you've got a lead glass filled gem. However, if you do happen to test an area that is uh, mainly of glass or maybe a surface that's so riddled with fracture, it might affect your contact that you have with the piece of equipment, then actually you might just get a very blurry, inconclusive result. So um, that's normally what will happen. So this is a piece of equipment that doesn't help you identify this gem and this treatment. On to the next piece of equipment, which is our spectroscope. Spectroscope, a great tool which basically shows us uh, which parts of the light a gem absorbs. So which wavelengths in the spectrum our gem will absorb. And from this, it will give us a pattern which we can often um, conclude uh, identity from. So for our ruby, this gives a very diagnostic spectrum caused by its chromium content. So rubies are 
identified easily through this test. And blue sapphires are also often identified because it has an iron line within the blue. However, sometimes this is very difficult to see. So what happens then when we have our lead glass in it? Well, let's just have a look at the different spectrums of lead glass. Uh, for the colourless to yellow glass, which we're going to have in our lead glass filled rubies, this does not have a spectrum. And for our blue cobalt glass, this does have a spectrum, a very strong spectrum, uh, which is a cobalt spectrum. So depending on which material we're testing, we're actually going to expect different results for this. So if we start with our ruby, our lead glass filled ruby, this is actually going to give us a ruby spectrum because the colour of the material that we're looking at is due to the ruby. So it's still going to have that spectrum. So here is that chromium spectrum. Uh, all you gemologists or gemology students will know this very well. So you've got your absorption of the violet, two fine lines in the blue, which is your iron lines, full absorption of the green to yellow, and then our chromium lines in the red. Here it is in black and white so that you can see it more clearly. So the glass filling is not affecting the spectrum whatsoever because it doesn't absorb any light itself and therefore this, uh, this test for this product is not going to tell us that it's treated. When it comes to the cobalt lead glass filled sapphire, however, uh, this spectrum will tell us that it's treated. So this is um, a very indicative test for this gem. So due to the fact that the sapphire itself lacks colour, but the glass has colour, we're actually going to get the spectrum off the glass and little to no spectrum off of the sapphire. Ooh, I'm sorry about that. So here is the spectrum that we've got for our sapphire. Um, beg your pardon. Here is the spectrum that we've got for cobalt blue glass. So this is the spectrum that we're expecting to see. So we end up having these three big bands expanding from the green, a large band, slightly thinner band here in the red, and then a large band in the red. This is the diagnostic spectrum for cobalt blue glass. So if you've tested something that says that it's a ruby or a sapphire, sorry, on the refractometer, but then you put it under a spectroscope and you get the cobalt spectrum, uh, you can put two and two together and say, ah, it's a cobalt glass filled corundum. There you, go. you may also see a very weak iron line uh, in the blue region of these stones. Um, this is actually due to iron still being present even in colourless or near colourless corundum. So you may also still get that fine line in the blue. Uh, but that's absolutely normal. So you may actually get a mixed spectrum. Now on to uh, one of the last pieces of equipment we're going to talk about, so the dichroscope. The dichroscope is a really simple piece of equipment actually invented by Gemme, and this is going to let us uh, know about the player chroism of these gems, so whether they absorb light differently from different directions. So corundum, where it's doubly refractive, this is a pleochroic gem, so it does show different colours from different directions. And then our lead glass, where it's singly refractive, will not show pleochroism at all. So here are our typical results for ruby, which is dichroic, showing two colours, red and orangey red. And then our sapphire, which is also dichroic, showing us dichroic colours of blue to greenish blue. When it comes to our lead glass filled products, for our ruby, where the colour is due to the ruby, we can still expect to see the pleochroism of ruby. So we're still going to get that dichroism of red to orangey red. When it comes to cobalt lead glass filled sapphire, where the colour is due to the glass and not the sapphire, we can expect a typical result for the glass, in which case it's going to be non pleochroic so the sapphire itself, where it's colourless, is not going to show you pleochroism because it has to have colour to show you its different colours. And now on to the Chelsea colour filter. So this is the CCF. Uh, this is a really basic colour filter, which basically only allows the transmission of red and also greenish yellow light through it. And basically we can look through this piece of equipment at some gemstones and it will indicate the colouring element of that gem. So different gems have a very typical reaction under this filter. The reaction for ruby, normal ruby, is just that it appears red through the filter. For sapphire, we're actually expecting it not really to change at all, or it might appear greenish, but that's due to the colour of the filter being in the way. And then we also have, um, oh, wow, 
lead glass filled ruby. So when it, we talk about lead glass filled ruby under this test, where the color is due to the ruby, we are going to see a typical result for ruby. So this will also just appear red, just like an untreated ruby will. When it comes to cobalt lead glass filled sapphire, this, uh, where the color is due to the cobalt blue uh, glass, we actually get a typical result for cobalt blue glass, which is red. However, it won't appear red as a whole stone. It will actually appear this uh, intricate network of red due to um, only the glass and the fractures showing this color. I've got a picture for this just so you can visualize it a bit better because I did get a little bit tongue twister there, didn't I? So uh, for the CCF, this is some sapphires that are underneath the Chelsea color filter. So remember that it only allows through the transmission of red and also greenish yellow light. And what we've got here, we've got two gems here. These are just synthetic sapphires. And so they're just appearing slightly greenish through this filter, otherwise no change. But then we have the rest of the gems. And what you're seeing here are your lead glass filled sapphires, which are actually showing you all of those glass filled areas because those glass filled areas are appearing red due to its cobalt content. So if we look at this gem here, you can actually see as well exactly where those fractures are because we've got two very large fractures running down the length of the stone. And then we have this network of fractures also here where that is appearing red. This can be actually quite a good test for saying or um, for finding out how much glass is within your lead glass filled sapphire because some of them are absolutely filled with this red color suggesting that these have more glass within them and then some actually only have this minor patch of red suggesting or indicating that there's much less glass within this stone. And now on to our last test, which is going to be long wave UV light. So checking for fluorescence. Uh, for our ruby, uh, its typical reaction under long wave UV light is just red. So um, this can actually vary in how bright the red can appear. Uh, for very high quality rubies that contain a lot of chromium or for synthetics, these are bright red. They're really quite impressive with their fluorescence. And then for maybe rubies that contain uh, more iron, you might actually, like the Thai rubies, appear a bit of a duller red, but all of them fluoresce red. When it comes to the sapphires under long wave UV light, these are actually inert. These do not fluoresce at all. And when it comes to lead glass, it depends which color glass we're talking about. So for the colorless to yellow glass, this does not have any fluorescence, but our blue cobalt glass does. It actually fluoresces a red to orange fluorescence. So therefore, when we see a lead glass filled ruby or a lead glass filled sapphire, we're actually going to have different results depending on which gem we're looking at. But for the lead glass filled ruby, we're going to get our typical reaction, which is for it to go red. However, you might see a network of dead non fluorescing zones within it, which are your glassy areas. But that depends on how much glass is in there. So that might not work every time. You might see these dead zones where the glass is not fluorescing. It's quite the opposite for cobalt lead glass filled sapphires. So uh, we're going to get that typical reaction of the host material again. So the sapphire is going to stay inert for the most part. But then you might have this network of fluorescence within the material due to that cobalt glass because the cobalt glass fluoresces uh, this reddish to orange color. Now, I don't have a picture of this, but I do have a picture of some other fluorescence under shortwave UV light. Uh, this is a cobalt doped lead glass filled sapphire. This is under a piece of equipment called the Diamond View, which is uh, actually used to test synthetics versus natural diamonds for their growth um, growth markings and growth patterns. Uh, but what it is, it's a very high energy shortwave UV light source. And under this high energy shortwave UV, our cobalt glass will actually fluoresce this chalky blue color. And you can see here in this picture that you have this network of this chalky blue fluorescence, which is indicating all of those surface reaching fractures, which are filled with cobalt glass. And then the rest of the material you can see, which is the sapphire, is not fluorescing because it is inert to shortwave UV. So this is another quite a cool test to actually identify the stone. So a summary of testing. 
So uh, the type of gem under the test massively affects the results in this stage. So for our rubies, really, we have no indication at all that um, it's treated in this way. But that's quite a different story for cobalt, lead glass filled sapphire, because actually for all of the color tests and UV, you actually have um, indications that you actually have this filling within the stone. The test results may not indicate treatment, however, on occasion it does. So characteristic test results do occur for our cobalt lead glass filled sapphires. But when in doubt, use your eyes because for this particular treatment and for this composite gem, really the identification is all within the observation. And often you can get indications just from your unaided eye. And then with your loop or a microscope, you should be able to positively identify the stone. You just need to know what to look for. So let's revisit those learning outcomes. So we are coming towards the end of the lecture. So if you do have any questions, maybe think about writing them on in a couple of minutes and um, so maybe start writing them down because then we're going to answer just a few questions at the end. But to revisit the learning outcomes, so what are lead glass filled rubies and sapphire? Well, they are a composite. They are a very heavily treated gem, but they result in being a composite of corundum and lead glass. So this is actually very industrial quality, low grade corundum and a mixture of lead glass. Uh, the resulting material is less durable than corundum. It's actually a very different product and it's extremely common on the market. And it does require disclosure because of that difference in materials between and difference in properties between the glass and corundum. How does this treatment affect the stone? Well, it's actually fused together the low quality corundum with the glass and it's actually created something that wouldn't have existed otherwise. So it actually creates a whole piece of rough material that was able to be faceted and then put on the commercial market. So that wasn't possible without this treatment. It is a very effective treatment, although the gemstones still have a lot of clarity issues, you can't really see those fractures. You can see color flashes, so you can see where the fractures are, but you can't see those fractures. It's made them almost invisible. It's extremely effective. And the other uh, effects of it, so not only is clarity improved, but the transparency of the stones is massively improved and the color as well. And how can we identify this stone? mainly through observation. So test results might lead you down the wrong way. For a cobalt glass filled sapphire, however, some of the testing can help you, but generally speaking, it's all through observation. So it's all using your eyes, using your experience and your knowledge to identify this stone. So there's a summary of those uh, inclusions for you as well. So now we've got a quick quiz just to see, um, just to see if you've picked up on those main points of the lecture. So I'm just gonna post that up to you right now. So bear with me one second, launch, there we go. So you should be able to see the quiz up on your screen. So this is just four questions, multiple choice. So have a little look through and I'll read you through them as well. So question number one, when did lead glass filled rubies enter the market? So 1984, 2004 or 2007? So select your answers now. Question number two, select three observation features of lead glass filled rubies. Gas bubbles, lower luster, concentration of color and blue color flashes. So you pick three features out of that list. Question number three, what color is the original rough material used to create the blue cobalt lead glass filled sapphires? So have a look through that list and decide what material that starting material is. And the last question, lead glass filled sapphires and rubies have the same durability as all other corundum, true or false? So select the answers that you think are correct and then submit your results. I'm just gonna wait just a couple of minutes so that you are able to get that in. I won't do a countdown or maybe I will. I'll do a countdown just before I end the results and then we'll go through the answers together. 
So I'll give you just another few seconds to submit those answers. So going through them in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna close that session and we'll go through the answers together. So let's have a little review. Here we go. So over a hundred of you did manage to submit your test, so excellent. Let's have a look. Question number one, when did lead glass filled rubies enter the market? The correct answer is 2004. So very well done, the majority of you got that correct. Uh, the other dates that I put in there, uh, 1984, that was the date of the glass infilling in high quality ruby that never really became popular within the industry, it did get rejected. So that's the 1984. And then the 2007, that's actually when lead glass filled sapphires entered the market. So I was sneaky with my dates because I did mention those dates in the lecture. Uh, but well done for everyone that got that correct. Question number two, select three features of lead glass filled rubies. The correct answer is gas bubbles, lower luster in the surface cracks and a blue color flash. So the reason uh, that number three isn't correct. So C, concentration of color in fractures, that's not correct. Um, that's not a feature in lead glass filled rubies, but it is a feature in lead glass filled sapphire due to the fact that the glass is blue due to cobalt. So that was again, slightly trick question for you. So on to question number three. What is the color of the starting material used to create a blue cobalt lead glass filled sapphire? The correct answer is colorless or near colorless to white. So very well done, most of you got that correct. And the very last question, lead glass filled rubies and sapphires have the same durability as all other corundum. False, that is a false statement. They have very different durability features to corundum. It's got a lower hardness, lower melting point, lower durability in general. So therefore that's why uh, it's very important to give correct disclosure when it comes to these gems. So very well done for everyone that answered the quiz. Uh, we're going to now ask, uh, do a bit of a Q&A. So ask me some questions. I will try my best to answer them. I'm just going to choose three at this point in the lecture, because uh, then we'll move on to uh, what you can expect next week and next week's webinar. And then for everyone that wants to sign off, they can. Uh, but then I will continue answering a few questions at the very end, if you'd like to stay and listen. So for now, please do pop them in, uh, pop, pop your questions into the chat box and I will endeavor to answer them. So I have one question that's just come through. Let's have a look from Sarah Lee. Hi, if low quality rough material has been lead filled, the finished gem should be classed as composite. Yeah, how about when the filling was added on a faceted gem? Okay, is it simply a treatment then? No, a uh, great question, Sarah Lee. So you're actually asking about the lead, um, beg your pardon. You're asking about the glass infilling that I mentioned that came about in 1984. Uh, no people were quite outraged actually that they did that and they called that a composite from that point. Um, so actually that was classed as a composite immediately. Uh, it's taken a bit longer for this one to be classed as a composite for some reason, uh, but very, very good question. No, that was also classed as a composite. And now even, because um, there is another treatment known as flux healing that you may have heard about, uh, that actually also involves glassy residues. And if there's any residues on the surface, then that gets called glass infilled as well. So. Uh, the treaters are very careful to make sure that that's all taken away. So the answer is no. Anything uh, with that glass content actually, or with the glass content that touches the surface is known as a composite gem, definitely. A uh, second question from Rachel Smith, are the yellow patches diagnostic or indicative? I would, I would say it's one of those indicative features, I would pair it up with other features in the stone, for example, those color flashes. The main reason is just in case you have a stone of patchy coloration. So just to confirm, I would get a second, um, a second clue or a, a diagnostic feature such as that color flash or gas bubbles, or pair them all together, look for everything. Uh, but that would be my advice. Then I have a question from Katharina. Where do they do this type of treatment? So like most treatments, particularly for rubies and sapphires, this started off in Thailand. Uh, 
So uh, that's where it's mostly done. Uh, so it's kind of like the treatment capital of the world. Uh, that's where it started. I believe that's where still most of it gets performed. Um, but some of it might get done, you know, on site from where they get mined, possibly. But Thailand will be the main answer for that. Ooh, when it comes to any questions to do with um, not this lecture, so with other study options and stuff, I would actually ask you to contact education at gemma.com. Uh, their email address, they'll be able to better answer your questions for you. Okay, and then I've got one from Lee. This is be uh, this will be my last uh, question that I'll answer in this section, but stay at the end if you want more. Uh, but hi, Julia, I would like to have your idea about the price about this kind of composite. So what is the average price per carat for the average quality? Um, thanks a lot. Okay, so um, first off, if we just talk about the quality of lead glass filled uh, corundum, it doesn't matter if it's just filled a little bit, it doesn't matter if it's filled a lot, it's priced the same. And uh, really, um, it has changed in price, like everything often increases in price with time and inflation. So it started off just a dollar or two a carat. Now it's 20 to 30 dollars a carat. When it comes to treatments and all treatments, really, you know, if you're willing to pay that price, that's that's fine. You know, I bought a lead glass filled ruby ring just to see if it would last through wear and tear in my day to day life. Um, and that cost me 20 pounds. I was happy with that. But um, some gems have actually been sold for a lot more when they're, you know, lead glass filled corundum. I've seen one pair of earrings actually that wasn't disclosed, naughty, they could get in a lot of trouble for that, but they wasn't disclosed and they were, I think, by memory, about 14 or 15,000 pounds. I don't know whether the people that produced them didn't know that they had uh, filled sapphires in them, lead glass filled sapphires, or maybe um, they charged a lot for their artistic ability. So um, generally speaking, I can't give too much of an idea on price, but I would, I personally would not pay more than 20 to 30 pounds. I'd rather spend just a couple of dollars on one if I'm very honest, but the quality doesn't matter because the starting material, you saw it, it's nothing special. It's very low quality. And then I'll answer one more question. Samantha Holmes, thank you. Do you have any tips for identifying lead glass filling in mounted stones? Yes, have a look for all of those observational features that I talked about before. So indications, first of all, that surface reaching fractures, get it under reflected light. Look to see inside the stone, gas bubbles and those color flashes. If you have it in a setting where it's claw set, you can see the side of the stone, you can see the back, have a look for it. There's um, one other thing which might not be too helpful, but you know you can get those heat testers um, for gemstones. Your corundum will have a different, um, I've forgotten the word, conduction, a different heat conduction, much higher heat conduction than the glass. However, you'd need a very large cavity to test of glass for that to work. So really, no, I would say it's all about observation, Samantha. So very, very good. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna hang on for any more questions if you like at the end. But for those of you that wanna sign off, can I just wish you um, many thanks for joining me. Uh, also on behalf of Gemma, I wish to thank you for joining us today. I hope that you've enjoyed yourself. Uh, that's the most important thing. Of course, I hope that you learned as well and that you found it interesting, but I hope you enjoyed yourself and um, take care. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you. You're welcome, thank you. If there are any other questions, once all these lovely people are saying thank you, once that's over, feel free to add any extra questions in and I'll happily stay for an extra few minutes and give them an answer. But like I said, if you wanted to just contact me through email, you're also very welcome to do that, or social media, happy to do that as well. Thank you, thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Oh, I do have a question that I just saw came through, which uh, basically asks uh, whether other colors of sapphires can be lead glass filled too. Uh, the answer is uh, yes, the starting material is still colorless, but they can use different colors of glass to fill the stone and to actually create these different colors of sapphires. So that is still possible. Um, like I said earlier, there was a slide on it, which basically still shows that there is concentration of color within those cracks, uh, but the color will depend on the color of glass that's been used. But you'll still see flash effects, 
surface reaching fractures, uh, luster differences, gas bubbles, all those features will still be there. So thank you. And then Sue has asked, how do we repair jewellery with glass filled rubies set in it if it can easily be destroyed by the jeweller's torch? Thank you. Um, basically, there, there's not much you can do. Your real only option to be 100% safe is to unset the gem. Now, I know that oh, I wouldn't want to advise just covering it in borax. I don't know if that's going to be enough to do and to protect it. So my advice would be to unset the stone, unfortunately but otherwise the ruby will be at risk. Uh, yes, and you'd probably have to replace it. But yes, thank you for your question. Any other questions, they can come through. I'll wait just one more minute and see if any other questions come through and then I'm logging off for the evening. But it's been an absolute pleasure, everyone. So thank you so much. Oh, I have one from Sarah Lee. So it says, if low quality rough material has been lead glass filled, the finished gem should be classed as a composite. I agree. Oh, no. I've already answered that question. I think we're done for questions, aren't we? Yes. OK, <laughs> I'm going to log off then. So once again, I'm going to say thank you. If you would like to contact me directly, feel free to uh, at Julia at JewelryAdvisor.com. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us again and take care.